Hello. Uh, so I'm Jeff uh, from San Francisco. Uh, I'm giving a, a weird talk. Um, so I shortened the title of it. It's called A Lot of Sustainable Services. If you've never heard of that word, it's fine. I made it up. Um, this talk is kind of uh, long. So I'm talking about three things. Uh, public infrastructure on the web, which is really interesting to me. Um, auto sustainable services as the title, and hopefully if there's time in the internet, I can show you a really cool demo. Um, however, there is a warning. Um, there actually isn't, sorry. There, uh, there, there's nothing here that's really specific to Python. However, every example I'm going to show you is, has been written in Python. And all these projects are open source, so you can, um, you can play with them and uh, join me in some of these weird things that I'm doing. So I was originally going to, I was invited to give this talk, the stupidest frame I could of me. Um, uh, and it was a much more technical talk. Uh, it was basically the entire thing was live coding. Um, if you're interested in, in distributed systems like that, uh, uh, GeoVent and Zero MQ, there's another talk from Strange Loop um, that kind of just an overview of these uh, tools. Um, and uh, so if you're into distributed systems, uh, I'm going to kind of talk about that, but not really. Um, I used to work at Twilio. How many of you are familiar with Twilio? So, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, basically a, a platform for making and receiving phone calls. Uh, and, and SMS messages, and making browser-based phones and stuff like this. Um, so it's a, it's a, Twilio is a highly service-oriented architecture. Um, it runs entirely on EC2, um, so we have to deal with a lot of uh, automation, fault-tolerant stuff. Um, and the, uh, and this is just a made-up diagram. It's not actually how it looks, uh, but kind of roughly. Uh, and, and, and definitely the ideal is that design pattern of small pieces loosely joined um, so when we, when we talk about distributed systems, we, um, a lot of the time we're mostly interested in sort of the internal distributed systems like Tulio's service-oriented architecture, and you might be talking about things like Zookeeper or Paxos or message queues. Um, but uh, there doesn't, there's not, for some reason, as much interest uh, in uh, the sort of external ecosystem that those, those applications uh, exist in. Um, and that's not just things like email and DNS, because yeah, they're all. I guess those are mostly solved problems. But really, every time we build a new web service, we're building another uh, web API or web service into this this ecosystem. And there's really not a whole lot of people that think about that ecosystem. And that's the thing that I spend too much time thinking about. And that's kind of a big part of this um, talk. It's sort of to me, it's like the macro level uh, system. And just to give you an example, take Twilio. Um, you know, it's an interesting, complicated, intricate system, um, but it's really just a small part in this sort of great ecosystem um, of web services, um, which itself is sort of a giant service-oriented platform. So Twilio itself is, uses EC2 and a bunch of other web services, and then you know other web services use Twilio and are built on top of each other. This ecosystem, to, to me, though, is really cool because it's sort of the uh, ultimate programmer toolkit. Um, you take a, an awesome HTTP client library like Requests, and you now have a library for anything in this ecosystem. Uh, well, what's in this ecosystem? Well, I, I sort of break it down into uh, a couple of, basically, four categories. One is data. That's pretty uh, simple, getting access to things like Wikipedia articles or IMDb. Uh, for movie uh, stuff. And then there's a little bit of an extension of that, communications like Facebook or Twitter, we have access to their APIs. Um, and that's what a lot of people think about when they think about web APIs. But to me, the really interesting stuff is the next level of stuff. Um, the next level is an extension, I, I kind of think of it as operations. So this is stuff like EC2 and SendGrid, the, an, an API to, that send, to deliver email. And there are things that we use to actually do things. We can actually spin up lots of stuff. We can materialize servers out of nothing, right? Um, we can uh, send email reliably. We can do a lot of stuff that we need to do to uh, run our companies, our startups, you know, our whatever the thing that we're running. Um, 
And then at, at, at the next level, though, are APIs that tap into real-world systems. This, this is the really cool stuff. This is what Twilio is cool for, because with Twilio, you now have an API to everybody's phone in this room. I can make everybody's phone ring in this room uh, if I wanted to with like a couple lines of code. And some other examples um, that prob you probably haven't heard about because a lot of people don't. Um, Amazon has a fulfillment API, which basically lets you send stuff to Amazon. They store it in their warehouse and then let you manage it via an API. You can send it to any address in the world via an API. So you basically have a warehouse and fulfillment as a service, and you can write a few lines of code to actually work with it. Um, and then, of course, uh, actually, uh, this one's really neat. Postful is an API that lets you uh, give it some a PDF or something, and then an address, and it will print it and send to, the, to that address, or a bunch of addresses. It costs about a dollar for every letter that you send. Um, but it's cool that there's an API for that. And then there's a bunch of stuff in the works, people basically turning everything into a service. Um, Mechanical Turk sort of gets at this, um, but there's people are working on like science as a service, trying to automate uh, laboratory experiments and operations, and then providing you an API to actually run experiments. Um, manufacturing as a service, people are taking a lot of the personal fabrication technology and 3D printers and turning those into businesses where you actually have uh, an API an API that lets you design a physical object and actually make it. So that's really cool. We're trending towards this idea of everything as a service, um, and that's really interesting to me because what I really want to do is basically program the world. Um, and that's sort of been actually the theme of a lot of the work, the weird work that I've been doing for the past six years uh, in my sort of open source uh, and I just do it openly in, in open source. There aren't a whole lot of people that really kind of do this stuff. Um, and so what I mean by that is I want to use, so you know, imagine these are all just web services out there in the ecosystem, whether they're Twitter or at AWS or Twilio or uh, what have you. Um, I basically want to use, um, and, and maybe these are um, not necessarily APIs, but they're just uh, web apps and web services that I can use, repurpose, and integrate to solve um, basically very specific real world problems that I have in my life or in my business or whatever with as little effort as possible. So I don't have to uh, you know, write a whole app to solve this problem. It's basically getting at uh, end user programming. Um, so a really simple example from a long time ago, sort of, I think it was around 2000, 2006 or so. So um, Twitter, it's kind of weird to think about this, but Twitter came out a year before the iPhone, and so the primary interface, that's where you get a 140 character limit, uh, was uh, from text messages. Everybody would tweet with uh, text messages using their uh, 3G phones. And so, because Twitter had an API, you could, I could repurpose this and use it as a free SMS gateway. This was before Twilio. Um, Twilio is not free, but, uh, and they actually, this was back when there were just a few guys and they thought that was a really interesting idea because the more people that use them for that, the cheaper they would have to pay for uh, The cheaper SMS would be for them. But say I had, um, say my personal goal here is, you know, I have my own uh, workflow, my to-do list system. Maybe I'm using uh, a, a to-do system like Remember the Milk. I don't know if any of you have heard of that. Um, and it has an API. So what if I wanted to put in to do's from uh, my phone from anywhere. Um, I could very easily just create a Twitter account and DM it from my phone and then have a script that grabs it, grab, you know, uses the API to get the messages for that user and puts that in this to-do list system. Um, and then maybe I have another thing that's you know, pulling the to-do list system and then sends me an email uh, for email reminders. And so I've added email reminders and uh, an SMS interface to, to this to-do list system. And this is a problem, that, and this is basically how I want to work, and I've, I'm using and repurposing these things in the ecosystem to achieve that. Um, and so it basically sounds like I'm trying to string these services together. It sounds a lot like, um, I don't know, ignore that. Um, it sounds a lot like uh, the command line, right? So you have the uh, Unix philosophy of uh, do one thing and do it well, and design 
uh, your programs to be used together. And so, you know, you get whatever, you can just kind of string things together. And you get a tremendous amount of combinatorial possibilities uh, for solving problems uh, from basically these really well-designed small pieces to, that work together. And that sort of represents, it's sort of an example of an ideal system. It has these properties of the parts are composable and are very focused. Now, coming back to the web, um, the web is not that composable. The example I was talking about, where I take these services and kind of make them work together, it's actually a lot of work. I have to set up something to pull Twitter, and you know, just setting up anything that pulls is a lot of work. Um, so, I don't know if you, any, any of you have run into webhooks. Um, uh, GitHub's post receive hooks are, are webhooks where you can like, put in a URL and it will post to it when something happens. Uh, PayPal, I, IPN, uh, whenever there's a transaction, you know, post to the URL to tell you what happened. Is, is anybody running into this um, webhooks or HTTP callbacks? So that was basically my uh, solution to making the web more uh, composable. So I actually, I coined webhooks and I started evangelizing it and getting companies like Google and uh, uh, GitHub and whoever else um, to implement these for um, for events in their system. Uh, and I was moderately successful. Um, the idea, though, was it was really getting at this, uh, I call it the evented web, but I wanted to turn this ecosystem into a more evented ecosystem, where uh, web services could act as uh, triggers for other services. So any event in any system, you can have trigger something else, which would make it a lot more interesting for uh, repurposing and doing more interesting things with that service. So the SMS uh, to-do list examples and it is really interesting. If Twitter had webhooks, which they almost did for a while, they now have a streaming API, which is pretty close. Um, you could pretty trivial, trivially make it so that when you DM that account, uh, it posts to a script that all it does is take the request parameters and post a to-do into your to-do system. So that's pretty interesting. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, taking the standard web API request uh, response, uh, you wouldn't be calling, you would then uh, just register a callback and then it would post to you whenever you want. And that's really easy to then post to any other service. So, um, thinking in this paradigm, I started building a lot of tools around this, and here, you know, this, these are things written in Python. So one is request bin, it's basically it, kind of like a paste bin where you get a URL, and now whenever you do any HTTP request to it, it records it, and if you browse that URL, you can see all the requests, and, you can see the raw requests, you can see all the parameters nicely formatted. And so it lets you inspect HTTP requests um, pretty easily um, and see the payloads of these webhooks. So this has gotten pretty popular, um, but it's you know, just this free open source service that I'm running. Uh, another one is Local Tunnel. Have any of you like, like come across Local Tunnel or Request Bin? So, uh, so Local Tunnel was another one where the inspiration was, well, if I'm developing these webhook scripts that are these handler scripts, it needs to be on the internet. I need a URL for, to actually use them uh, uh, out there on the internet. And so I made local tunnel to make it really easy. You can just say on the command line, local tunnel 8000, and it gives you a URL, you know, xyz.localtunnel.com, that will tunnel to your local web server. And that's just a simple command line uh, uh, tool but with a, with a server-side component um, that's also just free uh, and available. And this is sort of getting at uh, this idea of public infrastructure. And local tunnel is also written in Python uh, using eventlet. Uh, so the other thing is the web is not made of small pieces, right? It looks a little bit more like this. You have these kind of big monolithic pieces. You have maybe the small thing there is Twitter just because it's so simple, right? Facebook has Twitter as a feature of it, right? Um, so it'd be nice to have, not ne necessarily change that or fight that, but augment it with smaller focused services. Um, sometimes the solution you want is just so simple, um, it's just a simple uh, web service. Uh, for example, I, when I was working on request bin, when you wanted to do, uh, when you post file uploads, I would show those as, here are the files that were uploaded, and I wouldn't show the actual file, I'd show the file name and you know, a hash, and then a little icon of the file type, just for the UI to make that kind of convenient. 
But then I have to go and figure out, you know, from the MIME type or the, the file name extension, um, what kind of file, and then find an icon for it. And I was like, well, why wouldn't it be cool if there was just a little service uh, where if you sort of hotlinked this URL saying slash myfile.html, it'll return back a little icon for an HTML file. Or if you did, um, you know, slash, <clears throat> let's say, uh, sl uh, you know, codemonkey.mp3, it'll return a little icon for that, and you can just hotlink to it. It's almost like Gravatar um, for file type icons. I actually put this out on Twitter, I said, wouldn't it be cool if, and someone just built this, because it's so simple of an idea. Um, time API is another one, uh, I'm going to kind of skip it for time. Um, but the, there are other things like Gravatar, uh, hurl.it, uh, which is just a, an HTTP client as a service that you can use for debugging um, from the browser. And so the question I have is, why aren't there more? Um, although I don't really have this question because the answer uh, is pretty simple. They just require time and money um, to do. The economics just aren't, uh, they don't, it doesn't really allow it. So I'll, I'll, I want to talk about that more in a bit because that's a problem that I'm trying to solve. Um, but taking this idea of small services and then this idea of webhooks and composability, I ended up building a ton of these little services um, as public infrastructure anyway. Um, so the first one I made was called Mailhooks. Uh, and this, I, I don't think it actually works right now, but it is a little web app where you can go and create an email address at, at mailhooks.com that when you send email to it, it parses it and posts it to the URL that you specified for that email address. And so now you can create scripts or even web apps that now accept email and you don't have to worry about setting up a, uh, a, an SMTP server or parsing email or anything. It's as if it's a form post. And this is really, um, that makes it really convenient. And so getting back to this idea of program the world, of just having an idea and I want to string some stuff together, I actually have a kind of an interesting story. Um, so around like 2005 I had, uh, this thing called a, a hip top or, or a T Mobile sidekick. Um, do, do, do any of you guys remember this? Or did they sell them here? I, so it had, you know, it was pre iPhone, it had a web browser, it had an SSH client, um, it had uh, email, it had a couple of interesting things, and a full keyboard, QWERTY keyboard. And uh, I was actually out hiking with some friends, and we were taking photos, I was taking photos with this, and uh, I took a little animation sequence. And I was like, wouldn't it be funny if I could turn this into an animated GIF? Um, and so, but I was out in the woods or whatever. I had internet, um, and I didn't really know what to do um, to, to do that. And I thought, well, I can send email. Most of the time I would send the photos as email to myself to get them on my computer. Um, and I thought, wouldn't it be cool if there was an animated GIF email service, where if I send, it a, send this email address a bunch of images, it'll email me back an animated GIF. Um, and I, I had mail hooks, and I was thinking, well, maybe I could just build that right here. So I opened my SSH client and logged into my uh, server and wrote a PHP script, because that's what I was doing back then. Um, that basically took whatever file upload and ran it through image magic and then sent an email with a link to this, to this uh, animated GIF it made. And I made this out in the woods. Uh, and that's because of, of mail hooks, because I could just make this script and hook it into mail hooks and make this little service for myself. So I made a bunch of these. Twitter hooks never quite worked out. Um, now it would violate their terms of service. Jabber hooks let you get uh, web hooks when you send an IM to a, 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 a bot you could make from this. Um, and these are all free. You just go there and use them. Um, Postbin was the precursor to request bin. Cluck hooks. So uh, if you're familiar with URL shorteners, this was kind of like a URL shortener, but the point wasn't to shorten the URL, it was to wrap a URL so that when anybody clicked it and it redirected, it would also do a webhook. And so I used this, actually, um, I had another service that I built that's not around that would do, it was a notification API that would give you an API to send uh, in, you browse notifications, um, or any notifications via email, whatever, it was all configurable. And so I basically set it up, so I wrapped my blog subscribe link in a click hook that then had a webhook to a script that would use that service to send me a, uh, a notification. 
So anytime anybody clicked on my blog, they would subscribe to my blog, I'd get a real-time ground notification that somebody was um, subscribing to my blog. And then scriptlets was sort of like one of the most important pieces. Uh, I wanted basically like a paste bin where I could go and write code, hit save, and then I would get a URL that would run it. This was, this was like 2006. Um, and now there's some more stuff like this, uh, including the, the, what I wanted to show you later. Um, scriptlets as a project kind of died, but uh, it would have made that, that experience in the woods a lot easier because I wouldn't have to SSH in anything. I could just go to this website and write some code on this website and hit save. And so um, all of those things were actually, they're all services. They're all just, they're, most of them are running now, whether or not they work, but they're, you can still go to the most of them. And they're all run up, running on App Engine. Because when App Engine came out, I was blown away. Finally, um, something that's helping me solve this problem of building these uh, services. Because App Engine was the, sort of the first uh, platform as a service provider. Um, the, the sort of moving us towards this no ops movement where most of the system maintenance of, of managing a system or a Unix server and keeping it secure, up to date packages, um, would be abstracted away. Where all you care about is your service code, your application code, and you can hit a deploy button. And then it would run on Google, and you know, if you built it right, it would scale on Google hardware. So this was a big economic leveler that was important for building s these small apps. Um, if I had to manage all of those apps on like a Linux server, it would just drive me nuts and take a lot of my time just to keep them running. All of those services are also open source. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about open source. Uh, so, I don't know if you agree with me with this, but uh, this seems to be true. The majority of open source are tools and libraries. There's more tools and libraries than there are uh, applications. Um, which is really great. Libraries um, are basically what give us programmers new powers, right? Like Pill. Now you can, in Python, with a few lines, like do image manipulation, or with Flask, in a few lines, you build a web server, um, or PyTZ. I don't know if you remember the time zones, but uh, so thank God for stuff like that. So because these things are so accessible uh, and available, that it's sort of a form of public infrastructure. Right, you can use all these things to build on, and they're just available to the public. And the economics of open source um, allows for some interesting behavior, um, because it's basically free to release something as open source, so why not? And if you get some users that are using it, well that's cool, uh, and then maybe you, one of those, you can convince them to become a maintainer, and then you can actually move on to something else and not really worry about that. And maybe your next project, uh, Maybe your next project is not so successful. Um, but it doesn't really matter because it's free to have that project available, right? Um, but then coming back to web services, they're, they're like libraries, but so much more powerful, right? Um, you know, with the Twitter API, you get a feeling for the current uh, cultural uh, zeitgeist. With Twilio, you can make phone calls across the planet. With EC2, you can spin up a fleet of web servers um, and I was talking about stuff like the other Amazon web services. But the problem is, is that software has open source, but software as a service has no real equivalent um, that gives you the same kind of ability to just make these things and move on. Uh, and the why is probably obvious, right? Operations and costs. You're running a service. It's something that runs 24-7. It consumes resources. It needs to run on a, on a server somewhere. It uses memory, maybe uh, disk space. The source code just sits on a disk, which costs you know, practically nothing now. Um, and so for the past few years, I've been trying to figure out how to do this with all these services that I've been working on, because I think it's so important to have an avenue where I can, if any of you have an idea for a simple service, you wouldn't be afraid of just building it and putting it out there. and then you know, not worrying about maintaining it. And so I've been trying to solve this problem. And it's, so that's what I came up with this term auto-sustainable. It's sort of a play on self-sustainable uh, with, with focus on automation, which uh, you'll see in a minute what, what I mean. So I've been, I've been working with kind of uh, playing, this is still a little bit theoretical. It's been increasingly validated over the years, but um, 
I've had a lot of sort of experience implementing parts of it. So it goes kind of like this. For the operation side of things, uh, you need to use platform as a service. Um, embrace NoOps, embrace uh, DevOps. I mean, ideally your operations are abstracted away, but anything else to maintain that application you want to automate um, as much as possible. You want to, and this is an align, uh, aligns with designing small services, but design for simplicity. Um, make it as simple as possible. There's less chances of things going wrong, um, as well as scalability, so you don't really have to keep worrying about scaling it. And I know that sounds crazy to people that have worked at companies that, you know, they build services to <coughs> scale. These services are a lot smaller. You can build them stateless. They're so much more focused that a lot of the time, they scale a lot easier. Just doing something like writing it in a G event will do loads uh, for you. Aggressively avoid state. That is usually what um, you know on the cloud. That's where the problems happen with uh, scaling. Uh, so just avoid it. If you can put stuff in cookies, do it. If you can, um, if you can just expire data, do it. So request bin. Uh, originally, it was running on App Engine as post bin. And it would just keep all your post data. And I would just keep paying for it. Eventually, I wrote a script that would go and clean, start deleting stuff. Um, but the, the new one, uh, request bin, actually expires after like 24 hours or 48 hours or something like that. Because people don't actually need it for that long. So just delete it. Um, automate, automate. Uh, then we get to start getting into, well, this is going to be Ideally, there's very little operations work, but any work that is going to happen would be done by the community, um, potentially um, mostly your maintainers. But you want to give them as much uh, tools as possible to make their job easier. And so you, you want to take things like metrics and logs and make them public, or if not completely public, you know, limit to your dev group or, or, or your maintainer group. Um, and then obviously give deploy access to maintainers, which is as simple as basically, you know, giving them the account to App Engine or Heroku and saying, here's the command to run. It's as simple as releasing a package um, in Python. So then on the other side, you have cost, right? Because these things consume resources. Interestingly, you can get most uh, cost to zero a lot of the time. Um, on Heroku, it can cost nothing to run a, a G event process that can handle thousands of requests um, uh, per second or whatever, depending on what it is, uh, it's a web server. But eventually it will cost something if you're dealing with uh, you know, some sort of Redis or, uh, I mean you can get away with so much, like uh, Heroku's uh, Postgres service, they have a free tier, um, which lets you get away with quite a lot. And if you're deleting stuff um, and, and using it as little as possible, um, you end up not paying for this. But eventually you have to pay for something, right? So lower costs, obviously it's, you're a volunteer, nobody, you're not really paying anybody to, to work on this thing. Um, you're using, using things like Heroku and App Engine give you really uh, amazing uh, uh, cost benefits, like running on Heroku is free. If you can just run, make it one process. Um, obviously may, uh, minimize uh, resource usage, um, but eventually you have to pay something. And so as public infrastructure, you know, you don't want to start a business because that will just consume your life. Um, and the whole point is you don't want to, you know, create something that you have to invest yourself in. Um, so you're going to have to get money somehow. You get money through donations. Um, so most public infrastructure, public radio, Wikipedia, it's all donation based. Um, the way they work, though, is they use pledge drives and annual fundraising. So they figure out what their, their budget is for the next year and say, we have to raise this amount of money. Um, and they do a, a drive to raise that amount. And it sets urgency. And they get a bunch of, you know, convince a bunch of people to, to give them money until they have enough to run for the next year. These organizations, they're paying people's salaries and stuff. Here, there's almost no cost. And there's almost no humans involved. So um, it's, there's a little bit of a twist here. You build into the system automated ongoing fundraising. So with these systems, you can calculate the cost to run in real time. I mean, on, on App Engine, I mean, sometimes the fixed price, um, 
But on App Engine, you actually can uh, reflect on your, on your usage data. There's an API to see what resources you're using and figure out what your trends are and figure out how much you're going to be paying for this thing. Um, and if you know the dollar amount in your funding, funding source, whether it's a bank account or you know, Douala or you can use Google Checkout to pay for App Engine, um, you can use the API to figure out how much money is in there. So if you know that, you can actually figure out how long it'll take for this service to survive. So you show that to your users and use that as a mechanism to drive them to pay for it. Um, and you try to remove yourself from the funding path. So if you go bankrupt or your accounts are closed or whatever, the thing will still uh, run. And you can do this increasingly now with Google Checkout where you don't need to attach a credit card or anything to it. Um, the real... So this is what it looks like. Take a request bin. Say at the bottom there's a footer. This is just a mock, so we haven't done this yet. But you basically say, this thing's going to run for 132 days. And donate, please. Maybe. Whatever. People actually you know, occasionally donate um, for a lot of these services if you just put up the button. Um, but there's a lot of, you know, I do a lot of nonprofit stuff, and you can get people to donate more by suggesting a donation, prompting them for donation. There are a lot of tricks to get more uh, money out of people with the donation model. So then, uh, say you're running out of money and you can only run 60 more days, so you put more urgency on it. You use this urgency to actually increase the suggested donation amount. And when you really are getting close to ending, you say, this service is shutting down in 10 days without your support. Give us some money. <laughs> and then, you know, the thing is, if it's not providing value to anybody, nobody will pay and it will go away, but that's just as well. If people pay for it, then it goes back to this and just keeps doing this. So what does that get us? Well, it gets you kind of the economics of open source. I can build a service, put it out there. If people are using it, I'm like, okay, here's, uh, uh, you build a community, you get somebody to become the maintainer, and the community can support it, you can move on. You build another service, and you know maybe somebody's using it, but then they decide not to, and nobody's really using it anymore. So it just dies. Whatever, if you're not using it, you're not donating for, uh, for it either, so it might as well just disappear. People can just, you, I, you know, you can imagine activating it again uh, if someone really wanted it. A static page you can put on GitHub pages for free. Um, and then I can build something else, and as long as you know somebody is getting some value out of it, and your costs are low enough, and they understand the agreement that they're just donating to keep it running, uh, you can kind of let these things run. So the the idea here is to eliminate the economic friction to building small composable services, right? To get us back to this goal of my goal. This is a really weird goal, I'm sure. But I want to be able to program the world. I want to solve specific problems with this ecosystem of services. And it's, I'm going to need these small little pieces to make it all happen. So I think I have time for this demo, which is basically a new version of scriptlets. And it was the reason why I brought that project back again was um, I'm going to turn off the turn on the But the resolution is so terrible. I don't know if any of you have seen WebScript, um, but I was like, they came out and they were basically a service that lets you write Lua for all languages. Uh, it, it embeds well in sandboxes well, so it's, I guess it makes sense. So you can make these little uh, Lua scripts. Um, and hit save and trying to find a better, well, and so they, they made this as a, as a service, but it's, a, it's actually a, a company. And I made a, I was like, yay, someone built such script, scriptlets. But I, so I made something on there, and, um, and, and eventually their free account is not really free, it's a trial. After a few days, they say, pay us $5 a month or where to delete your script. And if I can run a G event application on Heroku for free, I don't see why I would want to pay $5 a month for a three-line script. So that really irked me, and so I decided to create an open source version of it that runs for free on Heroku. 
So I built AirScript Engine, which basically re-implements, it's not done yet, but it re-implements the same environment as WebScript. Um, and then we have a front end uh, called AirScript.io that gives you, and this is super in development, uh, but you log in with, uh, assuming there's the internet, you log in with your GitHub credentials, because basically it uses uh, gists and repos as, as the data store. So we're not even storing your scripts. That's stateless, right? Um, and then uh, the engine is running as a separate Heroku app, which you can deploy yourself. And in fact, airscript.io uh, um, will eventually just let you, yeah, will eventually just let you put in your Heroku credentials and uh, deploy your own engine to Heroku. And so that makes it a lot easier instead of running a centralized service. So here are some gists, and then this just gives you an idea of the, of the terrible UI because of this resolution, and this, I've been, we were working on it in the last couple of days. So um, all this is doing is show you what's in uh, the gist. You could just as easily go and make these gists on, Pro, on um, GitHub. But to make it kind of convenient, we're kind of making a really lightweight IDE, IDE here for debugging and, and reference information and all this. Um, and so the problem that I wanted to, to solve today as the demo was an actual problem. Um, so I'm from San Francisco, but um, I really like this town called Austin in Texas. It's, um, it's a pretty neat place. And so a friend of mine and I rented a house there. We rented a six-bedroom house, um, and we got some of, our friend, some of our friends to move in full-time. My friend who is on the lease with me, he travels a lot. I live in, in San Francisco. So we have our friends living there full-time, plus we have some people crashing there from Airbnb. But we're renting the place, and so when you deal with a, a landlord, um, oftentimes they don't want so first of all, they, they know that we're, we're subletting the place, but they don't want all these points of contact, so they want to talk to the lease owners. That's me and Ben. Um, but we're never there. So we had this issue where the dishwasher stopped working. Um, by the way, we set up an email list for the house so we could communicate um, on, on Google Groups. It's pretty uh, simple to set that up, so we did. and then. Um, we got this email saying that um, there's, you know, so the landlord tried to get someone to get in touch with Ben about setting up time to install this dishwasher. And Ben was traveling and, and you know, this is a real emergency for one of the guys there or whatever, so I'm forwarding this email to the, to the list. And then Ben's saying he, you know, he can't do anything about it. Um, and so this was, I didn't want to run into this problem again, so I said, hey, so should we set up a house number that just records voicemail and emails this, link with a, uh, emails this list with a link to play the audio? So that way, um, we can give them this, this number and they can just leave uh, a voicemail there and we don't have to worry about going to my voicemail or Ben's voicemail and then us relaying that to people in the house and coordinating. We just have it all go to this list. Um, so everybody's like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Okay, let's build it. So um, I ended up building it earlier, uh, but we use Twilio for this. Um, so just to, uh, so I'm going to buy a new phone number. Uh, so the way Twilio works is it uses webhooks. Um, so that when someone calls or SMSs this number that you buy, it will actually do an HTTP request out to my script or whatever, and it will e get back some instructions to either do something, or your script will do whatever it wants to do. Um, I also get a, a phone number from my area code. So I'm buying this number. Uh, so now, so I, I wrote this script, um, and I'm not. I guess I'll explain it. So um, it's kind of backwards, but the way Twilio works is you get a phone number, uh, you give it a URL, and it will call it, and it will send back some XML. 
with some instructions on what to do. So that's what I'm doing here in this else. I'm saying, say, please leave a message, and then there's a record verb. And so that's going to record some audio, and then take that audio, um, store it in S3, and then uh, post to whatever this action URL is. So I set it to basically post to this script, um, though include the phone number that was calling. And so that's going to actually have Twilio call this script again, but this time because it's passing the recording URL, it's going to run this. And so we just send uh, using the, this magic mail send that's part of the, the environment. Um, you know, voicemail from, who it's from, the number, and then uh, the text, which is just the recording URL. So we'll get an email with a link to this MP3, and we just click it, and we can hear the voicemail. Um, so we made this, it's, this is just a script on uh, gist. And the engine set up here has this Heroku app, and you can just, it's configured to point to that gist. So this is an example of it running, you know, if I just run it in the browser. Um, so I'll take this and configure Twilio to use that for the voice handler. Um, let me make sure this is still working. Let me get this phone number. Let's call it. So please leave a message. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, this is a live demo in Russia. <laughs> Hello. some sort of uh, common template for the project or uh, some, uh, some simple way to deploy uh, some abandoned project on your own infrastructure for example. Yeah, so I'm, I'm trying to come up with a couple of different ways to deal with uh, that problem of, um, so the, the question was basically asking about um, if you build a service and uh, you become to de you depend on it because you're building something like this thing that I built and it goes away, um, then your your solution is broken. Um, and then is there some way like a standard template to make it easy to put uh, your own version of that service online somewhere? That would be good. Um, yeah, and because they're all open source and they're using standard platforms like Roku and App Engine or whatever. 
um, you could very easily just sign up for Heroku and deploy your own version. And in fact, um, I've been trying to build into the services. Uh, for example, a local tunnel. There's a server component and a command line tool. And it just automatically uses this canonical server at localtunnel.com. But what I, what I wanted to add is basically the ability to, say, deploy a private version, and it will deploy to Heroku for you. Um, and so that way, and I've been building services that work like that. I built something called SkyPipe, which um, uh, is, is a, there, the server component, there is no central server. But you install this uh, Python package that gives you uh, a command, uh, a, uh, a pipe in the sky, so you can pipe from one computer to the other magically. And the, what it does is the first time you run it, it will actually deploy itself to Heroku. So you need to put in a Heroku account. Um, but then you have your own private instance. I actually call that pattern software with a service, because you're downloading software and it's creating your own private service. Um, but I, a template, so I understand your concern. I think though a template um, isn't necessary, um, but there are other ways to solve that, like, like software with a service or the fact that it's open source. Here's the readme on how to deploy your own your own instance. Does well, that answer your question? Yeah, sure. Uh, it doesn't have to be templates, but uh, if there will be some proposed uh, best practices to how, how to, to make your project also sustainable in the more broad sense. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, so this is just the beginning of this work. I've mostly been trying to prove it myself, and this is actually the first time I've ever talked about it publicly, or have really documented anything like, you know, how to minimize costs, and, you know, the sort of architectural approaches you can take to, to minimize costs and, and automate operations. Um, I'm just gonna keep doing this for myself, and if other people are interested in, in doing this sort of thing, we'll just solve these problems as, as necessary. Oh, this way you can probably make made it somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, any other concerns? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And compared to open source development, there's another problem of uh, privacy. If you are running a service, then your maintainers, you must trust your maintainers much more because they have your people's you know, information. Yes. Yeah. And how do you handle this problem? Or yeah. Um, so. Uh, so that was, yeah, was, the, the question was how do you deal with privacy and user data uh, if you're running these open source services and you're actually exposing, you know, you're giving maintainers or people in the community access to, uh, to this data, basically. Um, one way you can do it is to outsource that. So, for example, AirScript, I'm not storing any of your data. If you're just as private, I'm not, nobody's going to know about it. I mean, the system will download it and use it and use the API, but it's all using OAuth, and so it's a little bit harder for people to really get at that data, because um, it's not like there's a data store that they can just look at. Um, so I think that helps. You could also imagine maybe um, having people sign in with Dropbox or some other sort of storage thing and actually store all the data there, and so that way you're giving the people their user data um, or whatever solution. Um, otherwise, you know, you, you could imagine, and I've just thought about random things, that, you know, you, encrypting it and having weird, you know, it's, the, ID, the easiest thing to do is just to design things that don't have private user data, make things Thank stateless. Yeah. More questions? Thank you, Jeff.